My guest today is someone I've known since our days together some 16 years ago at CNN. He is the kind of person that's impossible to pin down. As a young man, he rose from the streets of South Central Los Angeles to become a pioneering black comedian. Today, he's also an actor, a news commentator, radio personality, and an activist. In all of these roles, D.L. Hughley pulls no punches, nor does he in my interview. <laughs> D.L. Hughley, as I call him, the other D.L. D.L., thank you so much for joining us. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. How you doing? Thank you, man. You just can't stop getting fired, huh? Every time I turn around, somebody's firing you. <laughs> Jesus. I knew you were going to start. You should be on the next Friday movie. <laughs> <laughs> I knew you were going to start at the top of the show. By the way, I wasn't fired because I didn't work for him, but you know, you know. I know. You know, the interesting thing is, both examples of the of, of the kerfuffle that was raised were raised by you asking, you, you, uh, uh, fulfilling your just journalistic assignment, which is asking questions that made people uncomfortable. I think the Vivek Ramaswamy uh, and the uh, Nikki Haley interview probably, you know, probably started some stuff. And then uh, the the uh, the uh, Elon Musk, and they all really are the same thing: is fragile white egos. Like like this whole attack on diversity and inclusion is really a, an, a, a, a tip of the hat to white fragility. That that a, a billionaire. Can't can't sit and ask questions. Maybe ask questions. Uh, just always, it, it, it tells you why the problem is so exacerbated. Because you have people who feel like these spaces belong to them, whether they've earned it or not, and they just they despise, uh, they resent being challenged. Wow, you came out of the gate. Look, DL and I did not discuss this. He came right yeah. out of the gate and and brought this yeah. up. But I th look, DL. Right. You're right. And I don't want to, you know, keep dwelling on that because that you know how it is. That's behind me. That was last week. But it was it's sure, been really sure. interesting for me to sit back and watch uh, people defend him or him, you know, say snarky things about but like troll me on the Internet. When he was right. sitting right in front of me, he right. didn't challenge me. But now he right. and others have this right. keyboard courage. That's that's uh, that's. When, when you when you when you are the uh, you the he's a, he's a, one of the richest men in the world, uh, he has opened the platform up to open one white supremacy. We're not even it's not even veiled. It's not dog whistles out there in the open. Threats and and racial uh, uh, tropes have gone up exponentially uh, since he's taken the platform, and it's all of the auspices of free speech. And what is it that they want to say that they can't? They feel like they can't. The only thing that they can't say that they feel like, the only thing they really want to say that they feel like they can't is really racial tropes and slurs. That's that's really it. Everything else you can say. Yeah. But I think that it just, it's where we are right now. And I think that they, I find it interesting that people who become uber wealthy want to buy media so that that way they can control them. I think all of the media companies are owned by a few families, you know, a few billionaires. And I think it's for the same reason to, to kind of, under the auspices of free speech, to kind of control it. Yeah. D.O., listen, I want to, uh, I'm glad we talked, I'm glad you're here, because you are, you, you're just honest, and you're real, and I had someone else on who was honest and real, so I didn't want to focus on this from the beginning, and sure. we're going to talk about every, the other stuff that you do and what you have planned and all of that stuff, but it is no secret that you've had some friction, there's been friction between you and Monique, and we had Monique on here on our sure. last show. She sure. briefly mentioned your conflict, sure. but I want to hear your perspective. What happened? Where does this conflict come from? My conflict comes from saying yes when everybody else was saying no. If I'd have said no, never. Not, if I'd have said no, I'm not going to have her on my radio show. If I'd have said no, I'm not doing this concert with her, then we're not having these problems. But I felt like it was important to give uh, somebody the benefit of the doubt. Obviously, uh, in hindsight, uh, I think uh, it's, it's hazardous. You know, you could say yes to drugs, just say no to her. Mm -hmm. And ultimately... Um, had I said no and listened to my advisors, like so many people have, then I'm not in this situation. If I said yes, it has led to this. It, it is a conflict. Uh, I feel like I have my side. She has hers. And uh, I, I, I'm going to do my thing, and, I, and she's going to do hers. But well, I have uh, nothing but contempt for her. <laughs> that's, that's the honest I can say about it. Look, I, it's interesting I, that you say I, that because... It's not, it's not even the kind of make-believe kind of contempt. It's the real kind. All right. Yeah, Wow. It's interesting that you say that because I have had people who, you know, she has said stuff about, um, and it's tough to hear, right? Because, but it's her story to tell and not mine. So 
Um, I had her on because for two reasons. One, I wanted to know about pay disparity among black women in Hollywood, which she brought up on my show 10 years ago, and now Taraji is doing it. And two, I wanted to know from her what was her responsibility in all of this. But I had, I did have people saying, no, you should say no to her. But I thought what she had to say was important because at least she was out front with that part of it about pay disparity. Well, we'll see how that works out for you. (laughs) Let's see how it works out for you. I mean... (laughs) <laughs> we'll see. Like, uh, I, I just ultimately think that had I listened to my advisors and had I, you know, not uh, chosen to give, like, ultimately, she says it stems from her coming on my radio show, which wouldn't have happened without, and I wasn't there, which wouldn't have happened had I not said yes. Mm-hmm. <laughs> she says it's a, t- it's a, it's a, it's a bill, a contract dispute, which wouldn't have happened had I said yes, had I not said yes. Yeah. So ultimately, the onus is on me for doing things that were contrary to my internal mechanisms and my and my team. So I, yeah. I, here, we, here we are. Okay, just one, a couple of other questions, and I don't want to linger on this too, for too long. Um, do you think, what do you mm-hmm. think, feel her responsibility is? Because she has, she says she doesn't have beefs with people, but for lack of a better word, she seems to have a lot of beefs with a lot of people. What do you think her responsibility is? In all I, have no, I, have no, I have no notion what her responsibility is. I have no, I have no idea. I, well, everybody has to kind of set their own barometer as to what they're responsible for. I can tell you what I'm responsible for. I can't tell you what her mindset is. I can't tell you what her idea is. But I will say this. When you, uh, where everywhere you go, a fire starts, then you got to be the matches. Mm. Is there anything that can be done to resolve this dispute? I, I'm, I'm not having a dispute. Okay. I'm not having a dispute. Yeah. I've, I've said all I need to say about her. I'm not having a dispute. I, I, this is, I think it's cost me in terms of, uh, you know, just some other personal things. I don't. I have no space in my head or heart uh, with any more thoughts or idea or talk about her. Yeah, uh, I, I've got to ask you because this is very sensitive, and I don't want to um, overstep my bounds. Sure. But I'm wondering. This has sure. been in the public sphere, and you have talked about it. Um, sure. I know how important right. your daughter is. Why on earth would she bring your daughter in this? Sure. Because we remember the conversation we had about Father's Day. We were going to do something together because we thought the importance of black right, fathers. Right, 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 right. And I know you right. know having a daughter, having right. daughters changed your perspective on on life. You said so. Why would right. she? Why would she do that? Right. You have to ask her. I have no idea. Yeah. I know that it wasn't worth it. It wasn't worth the carnage and the fallout. Yeah. But you know that's that's uh, that's kind of how that's kind of the. the stuff that people truck in. I can't tell you why it happened. I can tell you that it happened. I can tell you that it's had a ripple effect, and I can tell you it has changed the way I will ever, I will forever see her. Yeah. It, it impacted so, your relationship with your daughter? Of, of course. Of course. I think uh, impact is a different word. It, it certainly has uh, bruised it. It certainly has uh, given us, uh, uh, you know, we've had uh, some um, pretty uncomfortable moments. So, yeah, I guess it was, I would say it has definitely had an impact. Well, let's move on and talk about how having daughters has changed okay. your worldview. How has it changed your worldview? <laughs> okay. I want the world to be different. I think that every time I hear somebody saying, you know, I think that we live in a world where um, we pretend to use women as props. Like I'll hear somebody giving a speech about how, um, you know, illegal immigrants come and they, they do all this harm. Um, and that is uh, certainly a tragedy. But then you pass laws that make it easier for people to, to, to obtain and carry guns. And the number one way that American women die is at the hands of somebody who loves them. You made it easier for domestic abusers to get guns. You made it easier for people who have violent tendencies to get guns. Uh, you made it easier for 18-year-old people that can't even rent a car in many states can go grab a gun. And that's going to have a direct effect, uh, effect on the people you say you love. So don't tell me about the illegal immigrants who are in danger when you're passing city and state legislatures every uh, day are passing laws that make it increasingly more dangerous for women. Um, you're more likely to be killed by the person who's laying in the bed with you than the person who makes it up. But you demonize them. But the whole while, you're making it easier for a woman to control her safety or her body. So I think when you have daughters, you think a lot like that. And I'm sure the uh, a woman's right to choose is been a part of that thinking, right? Especially considering what's happened with Roe v. Wade. Of course. Of course. Well, listen, uh, you know, I, I, uh, I was born in 1964. I was the first one of my mother's children who was born with the, with the full rights of an American citizen. My, my youngest granddaughter was born in September of, two, of 2023. She was born with fewer rights than me. 
Now, um, you, you, we're talking about affirmative action is gone by the wayside and Roe versus Wade is gone. That is, un, that is untenable to me. I think that when I hear people talking about the future that, that they would envision, they, most of the time people uh, view it from a selfish vantage point. What, my taxes and what it can do for me and how can it help me. Ultimately, you have to leave the world a little better. And I think, I think that I've never seen men um, do anything that, in, in, from a judicial standpoint, try to do anything that makes their life harder. Hmm. Like embryo, frozen embryos of people, but you deny $300,000 they could feed poor people. So when those people finally thought, oh, I hope they ain't hungry because hmm. that's, that's kind of that's where we are. And so it's just, it's just a really, there is a, an idea of America where women are best served pregnant in the kitchen. It's not even recreational sex is out, out of the way. Uh, every time a woman engages in sex or a, a people engage in sex, they, they, you know, of course, in this dr- draconian viewpoint, they wanted, wanted, wanted to uh, uh, result in childbirth. And they only want to do it for a couple of reasons. One, so they can have workers. They want women to be pregnant and have babies for the same reason they want to extend the Social Security. Age. They want more workers to, li- to, to live longer, to serve the corporate interests and will longer, and to die when they don't have any use for them. Yeah. Procreation is, is what uh, I think what you're saying. Dio, you have not, I don't remember, correct me if I'm wrong, I don't remember if years ago you were you you know you were so um, outspoken when it comes to politics, and you have been lately. I don't know if that's daughters. I don't know what, if it's age. I don't know what it is. But why are you? You're not afraid to wade into the political waters, are you? Well, you know it's funny. I think I've always kind of been the same way. The same way. The stakes have never been this high. When you consider that the last two, uh, two of the last three presidents were pop, pop culture icons, Barack Obama and Donald Trump, they were, they were as as much part of pop, pop culture as they were uh, uh, political uh, operatives. Um, so I think they changed the way that people spoke about politics uh, and the things that were involved. But I've always had a kind of a vantage point of what of the way I saw the world and it had a political bent to it. I think now people are more in tune to listen to it. They're, they're more in tuned uh, to things because they have more of a, a pop culture kind of uh, a slant to them. Yeah. So you are, with that said, you have been very critical of the former president. I don't, you, were you critical? So, to, listen, I don't know. Maybe I should have done better research. Were you critical of Obama? Of course. Okay. I thought that Obama, a lot of the things that are happening now, um, I thought that he uh, did a lot of things. I mean, a lot of the uh, the the the, the uh, legislative agenda was was basically from the Heritage Foundation. So he bent over backwards to make sure that he was conciliatory, and they didn't take. Uh, I think that one of the reasons that we have uh, the the uh, lopsidedness in the Supreme Court is because of of how um, he was perceived and how he went forward. So I think I've had I've been critical of him a lot. I think that he wasn't as firm or as strong as he needed to be. I still think he was a, a great president. But in terms of uh, uh, Joe Biden, I, I was so displeased with the uh, the war in the Gaza, the the, uh, the turmoil in Gaza, that it really made me reconsider whether I could continue to support him. And I had a dinner with him and told him and the vice president the same thing. Uh, and I said, but the problem is I don't live in Gaza. I live in the United States of America. And I'm not going to, as a protest vote make my my children's life harder i'm not gonna give my uh my my uh vote to somebody uh in in a protest in a, from a protest perspective that would empower people that only want to make my children's life i can't think of one group of people who wants to give you guns and abortion to to rid you of any uh uh diversity equity inclusion it's just a lot of things like, in a, at one point in America, it was illegal for slaves to learn. Now, in many places, it's illegal to learn about slaves. That's a mindset. And so there are a lot of things that bother me, but I think where I see people, uh, where I have a clear kind of uh, line of sight is where I think what will be best for the future of, of my child, my grandchildren. What were you, so in this conversation you had with the, uh, the current president and vice president, what did, you, what did you say to them? You weren't happy with what was happening with the war, the, that they, you didn't believe they were standing I, I, up No, for I wasn't. I, well, I, 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 I think, I, obviously, I am not naive enough to, to believe. This is an American policy, and that 
that part of the world has been in this level of conflict uh, for almost 80 years. So I'm no, I'm not naive or foolish enough to believe that it should be resolved in it's just at, by the wave of a pen. Nor do I believe that you can tell a sovereign nation what to do. But I, I still think that there, and and I believe all like uh, uh, many people do that any nation has the right and responsibility to defend itself. But also, you can't tell me that they can't be more judicious in terms of the the loss of lives. If you are, if you either you if you're uh, getting the bad guys, as you put it, uh, and the and the numbers were would justify that, and they weren't so lopsided. Nobody's having this problem. But if you kill more people than you than you weren't intended to kill, I think that's a problem. And I think that as a moral leader, that or as holding yourself as a moral country and a moral leader, and not to speak to that, and not to speak to that as soon as I would have liked, or a lot of people would have liked, was a problem for me. Yeah. Listen, um, I, this is going to sound like you know I have a lot of black friends, but I do have a, a lot of. Jewish friends who we and we have these <laughs> tough conversations and I say what is it what, yeah. what is the um, morally does this align with teachings and you know I'll say something similar to what you said and they'll say to me Don you know maybe it's easy for people to think that way but when you're fighting for your very existence if you were fighting for your very existence you mean like black people have had to do all over the world that way you mean like black people have had to do all over the world here's the thing uh, uh, no one is denying that there was a, a tragedy. No one's denying that at all. No one has the market share on on suffering and 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 uh, and uh, dehumanization. Nobody has the market share on that. What I find uh, repulsive is after all that has happened to you, that you can't see how it mirrors the way these people are being treated. That you can't see any connection of it. I think before I was anything, before I was a black man, before I was a man, I was a human being and, and, and am one. And the, the wanton slaughter of people and the absence of people in powerful places saying things about it is repulsive to me. It is. It's not. It's not a slight on anybody else's right to exist, as you know, as you'll be assaulted for saying. It is that you see what you see, and it is impossible to to not have some inkling of feeling. But people people are losing their whole families. People are being destroyed, wiped off the face of the earth. And many of those people had nothing to do with it. And you could say, well, uh, you know, they all voted this way. The country it was one of the youngest countries on the face of the earth. Most people, most of them are 17 years old. I don't know that that, that is a responsible way to do it. It doesn't, it seems inhumane to me. It seems, uh, and, and, and almost everything I've heard them say about this conflict, I've heard them say about black or brown people in some incarnation. Okay, so... Every, everything they, every, every, everything they say about the justification for using these levels of force. I've seen them in different iterations say that about all kinds of people. Then in this conversation with the president and the vice president, what did, how, how would you, did you tell them how you would have, how would you have liked them to react? What would you like them to do? And did you share that? I, 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 we had, it, it got very tense. I will say this that uh, it got very tense. Uh, there was, it's not just me, it got very tense. There was a lot of shouting. And in the end, I, I, I think that I felt better having made my point. Uh, I felt a little more uh, clear about some of the things. I, obviously, diplomacy is not, you know, it's not my forte, but I know that one of the things that, about being diplomatic is you can't necessarily know what people, are, uh, let people know what you're doing. And most of it is done behind doors, but the optics of it, uh, for a man who I held in high esteem to turn from a moral standpoint, it really was a problem balancing and, and justifying in my head um, something I see as patently immoral. So do, it, it was, how, it was do you think they should speak out more against what's happening? Is that I'm trying to? What would you have them do differently? I think the United States is. I think the United States. If you any president of the United States of America, it's it's like if you become if you own a, a McDonald's franchise, you're still gonna make the sauce the way they want you to. You don't get to just do what you want to do. So that, that this, this is American foreign policy. And any president would act the same way. They might say different things, but they're all going to do the same, uh, the same thing. If, if there needs to be a change, it needs to be in the whole po political apparatus. Because we are her ally. Um, uh, America and an American president is, behold, is an ally of Israel and will act as such uh, uh, and even, even at great political peril. And that's apparently a lot of what's happening. What did they say back? You said it was tense. It was a lot of shouting. What did they say back to you? A lot, <laughs> a lot, a lot. Sum, a lot. sum it up for me. They didn't can. shout as much as we did. <laughs> that, well, who was a group? Wait, first of all, who, who were they meeting and, with? Who was part of this group? 
Now, see, I I, I don't want to get. I, okay. I, I can tell you a few. Roland uh, Martin was there, uh, 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 and and a lot. Of, it was it so was, it was like black journalists people. and such. And um, yeah, journalists, uh, uh, you know, just people from all kinds of endeavors. And all of us really had the same person. It was so bad for me at that particular time, and before I went, I couldn't see how I could go forward with my support. I couldn't, and and then. Uh, you know, I, I think I'm more clear-headed and more sober about it now. I think that there are more things at play than what is going on in other parts of the world. And but and, and then having a conversation with them and getting a chance to say what it is, what it is I needed to say and them saying their things. I don't know that we all came to an understanding, but I think I have a clearer picture of the way uh, things have uh, progressed and, and I, what will happen. I cut you off. So what did they? What was the response? If you don't mind sharing. A, a lot. At one point, um, from, at one from, point, well, how did they I, respond I, to I you? Is what up. I'm asking. Um, I think initially, <laughs> I said what I said, and then <laughs> Madam Vice President went, "Well, that's a lot." <laughs> she said, "That's a lot." I mean, so it was, it was, it was a lot, and then uh, we started talking about things we agreed on things we didn't things uh that i had a problem with reasons why what you know because uh i am not uh privy to uh you know what goes like i said earlier what goes on backstage i can only just tell you this that it looks decidedly calloused it looked callous to me it looked uh inhumane and it looked indifferent and and those and when i look for a leader at least some of those qualities have to be demonstrated especially at times when the world is watching. And you said you are, but you're still going to support them because you can't see giving your vote to the other person. Oh, right? no question. Okay. Come on, it's not even hard for me. And, right. I, and I hate when people go, it's the lesser of two evils. Right. <laughs> that's ridiculous. That's ridiculous. I, I, I think that, that uh, America has uh, a really... Either we believe in the notions of this country or we do not. Mm -hmm. Things that are clear. This man um, um, fomented an insurrection. This man has defrauded uh, the people of, of, of New York. This man has stolen the nation's secrets. This man has tried to intimidate and, 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 and to rig elections. Um, what is it you believe? So I think the very notion, the idea of democracy, he's an anathema to, but some people can. And I think that the, de democracy was always fraught with these problems because democracy needed principal white men. Um, to be principled at the right time. And we're all out of, we're seemingly all out of principled white. Yeah. Uh, listen, two things I want to ask you about. Number one, I just want to get back to Gaza real quick. Have you spoken to DJ Khaled? Because you've been really outspoken about him. Have you guys? No. No. What would you like? You, you said you don't, you can't believe that he has been so silent on this, considering his background. What would you have him do? Listen, my side, I, I can't have him. Listen, I tell you what I wouldn't have you do. I can't tell you what to do. And I can't, like, and I've said this before, I don't know when it's in his heart or his head. I know it's on his timeline. And his timeline is, is totally antiseptic. It's, 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 it's pristine. It's not even, there's no hint of something else going on in the world besides what's happening in his world. And that's fine. We're all entitled to the culture of of success. But when you have men carry you so you don't dirty your shoes, while well, we used to see Palestinians, Palestinians being carried because... Uh, they've been, their families have been destroyed or, or, or someone's been blown to bits. It seems callous. It seems, ca it seems indifferent. And if I were looking at that, I would say this man who's, who's a proud Palestinian isn't saying anything about it. Then it must not be that big a deal. That's what I would say. So I'm not telling you what to say, but I'm saying that we're, like, it's, it's hard to just these juxtapositions. You're playing golf and you're praying to God, exalting God because you made a shot. Uh, and, and there are, I watched a seven year old Palestinian boy pray to God for the strength to bear the loss of his whole family. So those, those images, uh, just, it's, it's impossible to, to not juxtapose those images in your head. Mm -hmm. And, and what you say is not, is, is, is not up to me. I think those things in light of what's happening seem callous and that's, you think he should? I, I you think way. he should be saying stuff. Listen, and also I want to ask you too, when you were talking about, I don't think he should be saying stuff. I, I don't know that he should be saying anything. I think that he should very, very clearly be aware of the thing he is saying and, and, and how tone deaf they look. It's, it's, it's literally, 
So you <laughs> let men carry you so you don't get your shoes dirty. And you don't see how the images of Palestinians being carried uh, that are dead or blown apart is, is, is off-putting. You don't see how that, uh, the juxtaposition of that makes you look callous. I just, either you're naive or obtuse. Either one mm -hmm. um, seems off to me. Yeah. Uh, listen, just real quick, because you said you don't, you're not going to throw your vote away on uh, Donald Trump. What do you make of, there is, this, there is this notion, and some of the polling actually shows it, that there are black men who are out there supporting the former president and that his support among black men is rising. You know, you had some words for Kanye as well, you know, the MAGA hat and all of that stuff. But what sure. do you make of that? Sure, sure. I don't make anything of it. I think that when I look at the reasons that I see the people that support him uh, do is because they, they kind of lionize his perspective. They want to be able to, to do what they want to do and not face the consequences of it. They want to brag. I mean, they're really the same. A rap video and a Trump presidency are the same thing. It's a bunch of shit that ain't really yours, and then you pretend like it is. <laughs> it's like really like like it, like after that video is over, you giving all that shit back, like all of it, <laughs> like it's all a facade. We know you don't own the cars. We know you ain't in the private jet. We know the gold ain't yours. We know the stacks of money ain't yours. It's the same thing. They're like minded, but I think there there is the one component I will say that they all resonate with is a level of selfishness. What can they do for me? Or I made more money. Or what about my stimulus check? It's never about anybody else's future. It's always about what it looks like for them. And there's an inherent level of selfishness that they seem really able to tap into. And, uh, I, you know, I, I think that there is a difference if you live for the things you personally want or you try to make a, a world different for somebody else that's going to be here past you. Just one more on politics. Do you ascribe to this sentiment out there by some, not all, that Joe Biden has not done enough for the black community? Yes. I think that, well, here's the thing. I'm also fully aware of the things that, that have, you know, if you try to get farmers' money, um, you know, black farmers' money, and Congress or a court kills it, if you try to pass the, uh, you know, John Lewis uh, uh, you know, Policing Reform Act and they kill it, um, if you try to, uh, you know, uh, reduce student debt and they kill it. It isn't like he hasn't uh, presented or tried to do things. They haven't been successful. And that's a political equation. That's not, that's, that's a political estimation. One thing I will say is I appreciate uh, how transactional the other side is. They wanted to get rid of abortion for decades, decades, and they swallowed a lot of stuff and they were finally able to be successful. But it's, it's naive and even ludicrous to think that in one, and, and one of, so one of the things I think is hilarious is I got into an argument with somebody and said, what have, what have uh, Dems did for black people? 56% of black people live in the southern region of the United States of America. 18% uh, live in the Midwest. 19% uh, live in the East and about another 6 or 7 live. So most people, black people, by far, overwhelmingly, live in red states and always have under Republican governance. They always have. So what could they do? Even if you say we expand Obamacare and you live in Georgia or Alabama or Mississippi or Texas, they didn't, they didn't enact it. <laughs> Even if you say we're going to, to, to give you money so you can, uh, we're going to expand Medicaid, we're going to give money so poor people can eat, and those states don't impact it, and how, how could you see it? So you've never lived under, uh, under, under uh, a progressive governance. You've always lived, if you live in the southern region of the United States of, uh, of America, or if you live in the Midwest, you live in the Oklahomas, the Missouris, you know, places like that, you've never lived, and you're a black person, and you've lived there your whole life. Mm. How could the things that Democrats have done, mm. Medicaid expansion, would help black people immensely? Who's stopping that? Uh, uh, the the other uh, the uh, uh, giving uh, money to the poor uh, to so that they can feed themselves. Who's stopping that? If you Jackson, Mississippi, is the blackest city on the, in in the country, the blackest city in the country. Who is making it that way? Yeah, is it is it this federal office or these people who are running these states but and are determined? to do whatever they can to, 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 to blunt the force just, of, to play, what, of progressive listen, policy. Just to play devil's advocate here, uh, you know, people would say, listen, sure. there, there are so many African Americans who live in the southern states, they could have uh, more political power if they would just show up 
or become interested in politics. If they would just go to the That's polls, true. You agree with that? That's true. So it's not of necessarily course. just the Republicans or the white people's fault. Black people should get start getting involved more. Uh, here's the thing, but they also make it harder and more possible. So, so there are a lot of things. I play. get what you're saying. My overall point was when I he when I hear people say, "What have they done for us?" If you, if you if you're saying that from the southern region of the United States of America, then the effects of what they have done you wouldn't see anyway. Do you the, the black women die disproportionately during childbirth, and why is it? Because part of it is has a direct correlation between, and, and many of them are poor. If you don't expand Medicaid and people are dying, you don't give a damn about them. But you want to say, well, look at nobody's done anything for us. Criminal reform, all, every every idea. I would say that every idea that has as, as, as propelled black people forward have been has been progressive, mm -hmm. and have come from progressive places. So all right. um, I just I, I take an umbrage to the notion that when you say, uh, you know, what have they done and you live in a solid block of people, look at what they're doing in Tennessee. People are moving. They look at look. This is not just me. Look at the state legislatures in Texas and how repressive they are, what they're doing. Look at Georgia, how repressive it. You, it's not me. Even if you were, even if the, they, they're, uh, they're an anathema to progressive policies, they don't want them to happen. And they're stripping them down and breaking them away and denying them. And they hurt poor black people. They hurt poor white people, too. When are you running? <laughs> I like women and weed way too much, baby boy. Way too much. <laughs> way too much. Way well, too much. It's, I mean, it seems to be okay. I mean, Bill Clinton said he didn't inhale, and there are other people who said they took a puff. Some are one of them in office now. So, I mean, yeah. and, you know, some of our pres former presidents like women, too. Why wouldn't you run? Would you, did you ever consider <laughs> yeah. it? It's not, it doesn't, it doesn't interest me at all. All right. It doesn't. Yeah, but I, I'm, I'm very interested in the, this notion that there are people who want us to move forward. And for me, it's really simple. Black people have no stake in the past, only the future. Mm -hmm. it, it isn't, it isn't black men who want to go back or white men, uh, black women who want to go back. They know what that, they know what that entails. We don't have romantic notions of what the world looked like or this country looked like back then. Um, but we know the only way forward for us is through and up and forward. Mm -hmm. So um, even even when I when I see the things that what what are people proposing that is so like I watch uh, people's economic fortune have turned on some of these policies, whether it was the infrastructure bill or the Chips Act. Uh, you know, look at look at the look at the Midwest. It wasn't factories or even even construction manufacturing is up, but. Look at where uh, people's fortunes are rising and look at what we're responsible for. Mm -hmm. that, was, that was legislature that was responsible for it. it. And people are now taking credit for things that they voted against. Mm -hmm. So it, the, the thing on one side, I hear people saying, these are the things we want to do from a technological standpoint, from an advancing standpoint. The other side, you can have guns, you, you'll stop uh, drag shows, you'll, you'll stop black people from learning their history, and you'll, have, you'll be able to stop women from having abortion. It's not really hard for me. Yeah. Uh, listen, okay, so I, I, as you were saying that, it made me think of something when you said we don't have this romantic uh, ideal in the past. Because, look, I love watching old movies, of, movies from the 40s, 50s, and 60s, and it's so yeah. glossy and beautiful. Yeah. And I think about... Well, what, right. the black people right. back then, they were like in the kitchen. That's why I don't see them or doing whatever. You know what I'm saying? Right. So it wasn't so right. happy right. for us. Okay, right. so let's. I want to move on now, though. Let's talk about your personal life, because I think people need to learn more about your personal life, right? Sure. Um, because you sure. have this beautiful, uh -huh. I love, intact family. You've been married to uh, LaDonna, who's your wife, 38 years now, three children. Yeah. You yeah. have a very big career. Yeah. How do you keep your family intact? Right. I, don't, I think I, I, it ultimately is this. I have uh, tried to be, um, for most of my life, a, a great provider. Um, things I, were very, I was very deficient in, I knew that I could at least provide. I knew that I could at least make sure that people had what they needed. Uh, and that's come at, at, at a great cost uh, in terms of time with them and uh, development with them. I am fortunate now to be able to start to develop those relationships that didn't kind of get to flourish because I was out of doing what I was doing. But I just, I, 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 the one thing that I do take a lot of pride in is so much different than the family dynamic I grew up in. And I love that even though sometimes I feel on the outside of it, because, you know, a lot of it I, I didn't see and, 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 you know, was gone for, 
I love that I've at least had a hand in fostering an environment where, where they feel loved and protected. And um, it, it made that, if anything, it's the thing I'm the proudest of that I've provided an atmosphere where, where people um, that are in my charge feel loved and protected. And um, um, I, I just, I, I think that that has meant a world. What I, what I necessarily feel a part of that sometimes is, is, is challenging because I am always gone. And I, I, I've seen myself in this way where this is the thing I do better than anything else. And, and as long as I'm making sure people have their needs met, which has been a bit of a challenge, but I, I love the idea that I have provided a place where they feel safe, heard, and cared for. I can't imagine what that feels like as a dad and a father. I just know that, you know, chasing my career and moving away from Louisiana, I moved away from my entire family. I missed so many birthdays and anniversaries and graduations and you know, it's just, right. it, and it's really hard when I go home, you know, sometimes people, they go from, you know, two feet to four feet to six feet. And I'm like, damn, you yeah. grew up that fast. Right. Right. But listen, you were very right. open about, you have, um, you have a GED, right? You, you've been very open yes. about that. Uh -huh. um, you talked about your childhood right. growing up in South Central Los Angeles. You've been yeah. through some really rough yes. times. You've even publicly shared that you were at one point a member of the Bloods. How did you manage right to get to this point? I don't know. But I, I will say this. Even at a very young age, even though a lot of things were going on around me, a lot of things uh, I saw, a lot of things um, felt, it always felt like, it always felt like on the edge of something happening. I, I live, my, like I used to have stomach aches all the time because there was always something going on. But even in all that down, I knew that something was different. I always knew I would see things that they wouldn't. And I don't know what to attribute that to. So I, I can't tell you why, but I can tell you that I think about that often. Um, how, like, I, I can't say, uh, it would be arrogant for me to say that it was something I did or that it was just happenstance. I know that there was a thing at play. And you could call it God, you can call it the universe, you can call it the spirit. But I know there was something, some being, something, some presence, some power uh, that, that had their hand on me and helped me to where I am right now. And I can still, even in the dark times now, I can still feel something um, 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 that, that guides me and keeps me uh, safe. Do you have doubts? Because <laughs> I don't know what black men ever said. Do you ever have doubts? Sure, every day. Every day. Every day. All day, How do you get through day. them? What do you do? Every day. You just keep moving? I try to wake up every day. That's all you can do. And, and I, I got to say this to you. I had always, and you know, we had, we, we, you know, we had a, a, a different relationship than we do now. I was going to talk about but that. But watching the way that you had. Go on. Sorry. Okay, well, I, no, but I'll say on. this no, no, as on, a prelude. Go on. <laughs> watching the way that you have handled um, such a public uh, attempt at annihilating your character and uh, your career, watching the way you've handled it with a plum and dignity uh, and strength and courage uh, makes me so proud that you're a black man. It makes me so proud. It really does. It makes me I, like, well, you know how I felt. I, I called you and told you how I felt. But I think that everything that they think about us you were different. You didn't get angry. You weren't a victim. You didn't blame. You just did. Hmm. And even in this last thing, so I, I can't, I can't tell you how proud it makes me, uh, because what what I think culturally we do, we own the black, the, the bad things. Like when something happens, oh, I hope that ain't a black person. But we don't own the good. So we're we're a generation that got Barack Obama and Flavor Flav. We got a nation of people. But I think to see people like you in a very public way who handle uh, animos uh, who handle adversity and, yeah. and, and really I think things that would shatter a lot of people to watch you do that made me very proud. Thank you. Well, I, they, I, I told you that anyway. You so. did. The, uh, and look, um, this, is a, this is what I want people to know. Like when I had that conversation with Elon Musk, and I was going to go into business with him, right, to be a, it's because I really do believe that having relationships with people and talking it out can change things, right? You and I had a very different relationship. I once had not a in very, America, right, not anymore. But I had a different relationship with Spike. But but I I think that talking things out and having conversations can help. But you know maybe I just maybe I just learned my lesson for good 
for the fa last and final time, God, God was saying, no, it doesn't work. I hope it doesn't. But why do you say not anymore in America? Because I think that look at how strident people are. Look at how strident. You're wrong the, to assault diversity, equity. Like I heard uh, somebody saying that they can vote for Biden because he's crazy. I mean, he's old and he has a, a diverse cabinet. It was white men running the world when COVID happened. It was white men and white a white cabinet saying we should uh, use bleach and disinfect it. Who, who, who failed the world? And light, you know, light uh, inside so the I body. I saw a guy talking about he, he right. I, I saw a guy talking about he's scared to get on a plane. He sees a black pilot. It was black pilots uh, uh, who who doing World War Two that didn't lose a that, that, that didn't lose one plane. It's black people that the reason you can have heart surgery and the reason that you have uh, the blood transfusion and all those things. So to, to, to attack diversity as if the because it feeds into this narrative that the, this replacement idea that they have, that things were better when they ran things and they weren't. Hmm. They were not better. Yeah. The country wasn't better. Uh, things weren't better. The economy wasn't better. You, did, you do placatory things. You give people guns and you let people control women's bodies. And to a lot of people, that makes that feels good to you. But what has moved forward for you? There's a reason that, that the places that stay the same stay the same because they're keeping the same mentality. Uh, Mississippi's all run, white, white run. How's that running? Alabama's all white run. How's that going? South Carolina's all white run. How's it going? So this... this People and, and Elon Musk is one of those men, and I think it's it's no notion in my head. No, no, no. I, I have no no uh, contrary evidence. I think he's a white supremacist. I think he supports the notions of white nationalism, and I think having a black man asking them questions was something he wasn't going to take. I watched his face change when you asked him that question. I watched it. And people can pretend like you can talk to people like that. And if you could talk to people like that, we wouldn't keep constantly coming back to what we're trying to get away from. Everything that we, every uh, forward movement we've had, they've tried to strip away. Affirmative action, schools, diversity and inclusion, history, because they don't want to hear it because it's a challenge to the idea they have of themselves. And that man is the, is the poster boy for that bullshit. Well, you said... <laughs> Um, white so I think that, I think there are some people you can talk to, and and, and there's some people you can't. White supremacists, people are going to take, you know, they're they're not going to take they're not going to take that lightly. They're going to go, hey, man, you you're saying okay. that DL, okay, you're saying that Elon Musk is a white supremacist. That's harsh. I'm saying I'm saying yes, I'm saying yes, I'm saying if it walks like a duck, it talks like a duck. You don't you can't truck in these racist, racist tropes and post stuff on your page and then say, come on now. Yeah. It's, 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 stop. Let's stop. Yeah. Let's, let's call things what they are. You know what's interesting is that I had um, Kara Swisher on, and, and, and I talked to her a lot. She says the exact same things that you do. But she's a white woman. You're a black man. I'm, I'm interested to see what the response is from you saying it and then her saying it. Because she says the exact same thing about, you know, all of those planes that have crashed and whatever. Most of them, there was white guys. It was, you know, uh, people who, uh, you know, the housing crisis and all of that. It was white. She says the same thing that you say. I just want to. Exactly. I, I'm wondering what the exactly. response is going to be. Listen, uh, I got to wrap it up here. But I got to tell you, look, I appreciate what you said about me. I thank you very much for that. You have had so much success you have uh, in television, uh, in films, radio. You've written five books, two of which was, have been on the New York Times bestseller list. You have a lot coming out. Mm -hmm. I look up to you. Um, you're a mentor to me. Where do you go from here? What's next? I think for me, I, the thing I'm most excited about, I'm in development with... Uh, with uh, CBS on a, a new version of where my life is now, which excites me. But I'm writing a book, and it's called Charlie's Boy, and it's about my father. Um, when I was growing up, my father uh, would always call me boy, or somebody would see me and go, Charlie, you know you're growing up, they go, that's Charlie's boy, yeah. that's such and such's boy. Um, they didn't say Charlie? And he said it to me uh, about me. Charlie, you know, Charlie. Charlie's boy. That's that's because when I posted, I, when I pitched it to the publisher, they're like, "You mean Charlie?" No, I mean, but I said Charlie, but of course. And um, my father is the strongest, wisest, uh, most resonant figure in my life 
And I, I, I have better conversations with him now than I ever would have had when he was alive. So this is a perspective of my father um, and how he shapes and guides my steps and how I guide my children's steps. So it's going to be called Charlie's Boy. So we're writing that now. And I'm very excited because it's, we often hear uh, mothers get love, black mothers get love letters, mm-hmm. but very few black fathers. And I think he is, is an, it's called Charlie's Boy, an ode to a black father. And I'm very excited about writing. So, DL, you know, you have, our show just recently began it running on streaming, also on, you know, social platforms and everywhere you can get your streaming content, so, podcast or sure. whatever. Um, you have been in this world for quite some time with your radio show running 11 years. Don't ago. say it like that, man. Hang on a minute. <laughs> <laughs> I've been in this world for a little while. Yes, I have. Yeah, 11, 11 years. <laughs> I meant 11 years your, your show has been running. Do you have any advice? You know what? I, I would say this. The, the things you just got, the things that have caused you the most, uh, the reason you're here right now, everything you've done has led you to this very point. Everything you've done. Uh, the interviews, the slings and arrows, uh, the doubts, the, the successes on you know, on one platform and having to go into another uh, arena that you're not necessarily uh, certain about. Everything, I have a friend named Mark Jackson. He's a preacher and I don't, you know, I don't, I'm not, I'm not a a Bible thumper, but he said, everything you're looking for is looking for you. Mm -hmm. And I think everything you ever wanted to be is right before you right now. And that makes me very proud of you. I don't, I don't know how to turn out, but I know that, if your first interview is getting in trouble with the dude, <laughs> if your first interview is that explosive, you in the right place, baby boy. <laughs> Dio, I love, I love how you just only you, uh, only you. Only, thank you. I love how you just you're so honest, you're so real. You don't take anything personally. You're not touchy. I, I, just, I love it. So, DL, thank you so much for appearing on the program. I hope many times to come. I love back. you, man. I, I love you as for well. Sure. I appreciate. For sure. it. We'll see you next time, everyone. That for, is the Don Lemon Show. Okay, Thank you so much for watching. And remember, the conversation doesn't stop when the cameras stop rolling. Thanks for watching the Don Lemon Show. Make sure you click on the image in the top right to subscribe to my channel and the thumbnail in the bottom right to watch more content from my show. And I'll see you next time.